And here we are. Hello, Hello. everybody. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Welcome. Thanks, um, man. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I've, I've only ever done one live stream on my channel before, and that was a long time ago with uh, our good friend Troy. Oh, um, yeah. So I thought it was about time again. And to be honest, this, this idea with the two of us here actually kind of came from you, Richard, coming to the farm a few months ago. Mm -hmm. And we spent... Correct me if I'm wrong. I think we spent six hours walking around talking about home automation. <laughs> yep, pretty much. Something like that. Twenty different things. I think at one point I said, well, "You and I need to talk about waterproof boxes, boxes and bulkheads." Because yes, definitely. Yeah, sticking a, a an upside down yogurt container over an ESP32 not sufficient. <laughs> it's fine. It works just fine. Everything's fine. Um, it's fine. <laughs> So, but you know, so it's so much here, wetter in BC that like making yeah, something true. that survives outside is challenging. Yeah, it does get wet here, but nowhere near that level. Mm. Um, yeah, so so we are here basically to um, I don't know converse, but yep. I really hope that everybody watching will also have a bunch of questions about home automation and anything else really. But we'll see if we answer the other ones um, the, because I, I get a ton out of these things every single time. Like I learn so much from the youtube comments on my videos i learned so much from like walking around with you for six hours um and this is another medium of trying to expand the community and just get more knowledge um about all these wonderful things that we nerd around with um so if you do have questions please put them in the chat and we'll get to them and hi andrew someone had already put a comment there i will, I will write, write as well hi everyone but yeah so that's why we're here um and what do you want to start with, Richard? Do you want to do you want to just explain to people how long you've been into home automation? Because it's quite a while in many different. Yeah, ways. I mean, I I do think generationally around home automation too, right? Like I'm an old X10 junkie. We bought this house in 2000, and you know, world the things were pretty primitive back then. But uh, and it was a sort of a rancher with a basement was built in 1960 it needed some basic upgrades like right away we put in new new plumbing upgraded the electrical uh, i i'm very keen on great hvac and you know and i've come to appreciate as i've immersed myself in hvac all over the world like where you live matters a lot to the kind of heating and cooling you want to do in your house and and for me the biggest thing was i wanted i like forced air heating and for and forced oh, air yeah. cooling for that matter uh, because it brings new air into the house all the time. However, it's not a system that zones well, right? Normally, it, you you pretty much just have a thermostat in a hallway somewhere, and that's it. And I wanted separate zoning for every bedroom, as well as on the floors. Uh -huh. And so yep. I cracked that one back in 2003. But when it came to, you know, seeing, like having great lighting means having lots of different lighting loads in a space, which means you either have wall plates this big, or you come up with a scene lighting yeah. system and all of the Crestron and stuff of the early aughts were terrible, incredibly expensive and unreliable, like your perfect combination. And so uh, I tinkered with X10 for a long time, but X10 has lots of reliability problems. Like, you know, trying to send little spikes on the zero point of a 60 hertz cycle, you know, it <laughs> can only be so good. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that like that's, <laughs> but that's how things used to work, man. This is, oh, you yeah. know, before Ethernet was even big, really. Like it was, it, and Wi Fi was still young. Jeez. So, and I encountered a technology in like 2003 for, made by Light O'Lear called Compose PLC. And what Compose PLC did was it took the X10 standard. And then it allowed you to isolate circuits that were going to use it. So what murdered X10 trying to insert into the sine wave was motors and heating coils, anything that would spike the, the waves, right? And so, and you recognize that the only place you're actually going to want to do control with X10 is lighting circuits and some outlets. So what you'd actually do is you'd add a, this firewall, this composed PLC controller, and you'd route all of the circuits that you wanted to have uh, access through X10 through that. And that allowed you to bridge the two legs and, and clean up the signals and so forth. And so I had scene control in like 2003. Wow. Now, the technology is completely obsolete. It's long gone now, but 
you know, over time I had to just gradually replace the pieces. Uh, and then when we rebuilt the house in 2009, then we, mo we moved over to, um, more modern technologies. I mean, now, now we have Lutron, Casita and, uh, remote HA2 and, and, you know, much better, more advanced stuff. Yeah. I was about to say that we don't know how, how good we've got it <laughs> currently. Cause yeah. I'm, I'm the first to bitch and moan about these <sighs> integration points that just don't make any sense. And, you know, there's just, there's so much to get your head around, but it's nowhere near the arduous soldering task that it used to be. Um, yes. So. Well, and I, and it was not an unhappy day that I finally rounded up the last of my X10 hardware, put it in a big box, put it outside on the front drive under cover and said on Facebook marketplace, if you like X10, take the whole box yeah. or nothing, but have uh -huh. it all. Some of which had never, you know, I, and I was always big, even then on, if I found a really great component, I bought three spares because you never knew when it was yeah. going to go away. And if you didn't have the spares, you know, then you were going to be in trouble. So there was a bunch of stuff that was still. I do that now. Oh, I still do. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's, um, yeah, I've, I've no, not been in home automation anywhere near that long. Um, my journey started more out of necessity and laziness more than anything, to, I think. Um, when we bought the farm here and I realized after a couple of years that we were constantly walking up the hill to check the water tank. There's like a yeah. bore to pump water up. And then we'll, we have, you have to climb up on a ladder to look in the tank and go, oh, no, yeah, no, it's empty or it's not empty or it's full or whatever. And then turn on a bore pump to fill it and then walk up back up the hill a couple hours to see if how much it filled up. Oh, no, it's not quite fully and walk down the hill again. And you just kept doing that. Forever. And you forget about it for long enough that it starts to overflow and it's like. Correct. Oh, it's why? Done many what? times. Yep. Why? why is this this green patch of grass in summer down the, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh, crap, yeah. right? It's us. We're so, doing that. But, you know, so it's interesting, you have that big property and you, there's certain services of life that you are responsible for maintaining yourself. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it makes yeah. a lot of sense to have those work as well as possible. Oh yeah. Um, and it's uh, the, the primary screen on, you know, we've probably got to talk about home assistant mm. on my home assistant installation on my dashboard is the water dashboard. Yeah, Cause it's you, you're important. responsible for so much related to water. So now I have measured, I have made videos on how to, you know, put your level, uh, figure out your level in your water tank. We have all four water tanks now. You can measure exactly how much water is in them, where it's going. They fill up automatically, et cetera, et cetera. It's beautiful. But it took a couple of years to get that far. But you, that was only possible when you got Wi-Fi everywhere, right? Like, well, yes. That, you start thinking about the infrastructure aspect of making correct. this possible. Uh-huh. We had, for the longest time, we had three different SSIDs. So we had yeah. a Wi-Fi that was for the house, which was your standard provided by the internet provider, you know, with the antennas thing. Right. Um, we had one for a second residence and I had one for the office here. And they were all repeated by each other, but they were all different SSIDs. And it was a nightmare. Like It was such mm -hmm. a pain. Um, so once I moved to Mesh, uh, mainly because I was sort of like, I need to fix this because it's not really usable. And then once you have the Wi-Fi everywhere, I think we have 30 acres covered in Wi-Fi now. Yeah. You can start to put everything on the wi on the internet, essentially, or on the local network, and you can start mo monitoring and measuring and automating. We're, I think, again, it's the, it's the point we are in history where the concept of the prosumer infrastructure makes a lot of sense. Like my first mesh implementations were done with um, Cisco gear that was catastrophically expensive. It was enterprise class gear. <laughs> But I was certified and I was allowed to buy the stuff. And so it's like we were wildly overpowered. And then when it, and then when it all, when they end of life did on me and I literally couldn't, and my license had expired and I couldn't get firmware and stuff for it. I switched uh -huh. up for an, for a WRT 54 G with DDWRT on it and an overdriven amplifier and oversized antennas. How did you remember that number anyway? I don't get to forget. You know that about me. <laughs> I know. And yeah, know and that. one AP did the whole thing and was, you know, you know, the Canadian equivalent of the FCC figured out I probably wouldn't find that thing was jacked. <laughs> but, yep. Yep. Yeah. Today it's ubiquitous. Yeah, we have, um, <laughs> we have. So Andrew has put a bunch of different questions in the in the chat. He wants and to one get of to my work. 
I, that's fine. I like it. That is, yeah. So I'm going to put this question up here. And that's one of my favorite types of people in the mm. world, the people that are keen to get started because they just want to learn. And I love it. So thanks, Andrew, for putting that up first. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I mean, it, nah, if you're no. a, I'll tell you this. If you're a programmer, then yes. Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of programming concepts in there that for a dev, it'll be trivial. For a regular mortal, you are not going to justify that amount of learning you're going to need to do to be successful with it until yeah. you get to a certain level of complexity. Here's the downside. You have to pick some place to put your automations. Home Assistant is the ultimate manifestation of that, but it's complicated. But if you start down the path of you're using one of Amazon's devices or one of Google's devices or heaven help you, Samsung Smart Things. Um, and you start putting automations in there, when you hit the wall on those, and you will, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to undo all of that to move to Home Assistant. So yep. as is the typical disease of smart people, you tend to jump to the end game without being willing to show your work. But if you go along that work a little bit, you start to appreciate why you would want Home Assistant. Mm -hmm. And that a lot of basic things can be done in any one of the simpler home automation devices until you hit their limits. Yeah, I think my reason for using Home, home Assistant was, well, two friends recommended it. Uh, I do like programming, but more than anything was I have started having 12, 14 apps on my phone to control things. Yeah, and, and that's always like, terrible. Oh God, it was such a bad experience. I mean, yet, to me, Google your biggest justification is the dashboard because you needed a view yeah. and that's very hard to do almost any other way, right? Oh like, yeah. The, oh, the and, one and thing that the HJ thing. brings to you is a good dashboard. Yeah, where's my things? Show me the things, right? Yes. And that's it. Like, I don't want to have to go hunt for it. But consolidation is one thing. Knowing the state of your water is another. Like, you did have an unusual case for a dashboard early on. Sure. I think most people's dashboards it, are just cool, okay. right? But your up. dashboard was kind of essential. Yeah. Uh, hey, let me just, uh, let me go. I'm going to show. This is, okay. So. Bear with me. I'm gonna gonna have to uh, figure this out. Keep keep talking about yourselves. <laughs> yeah, and and I'm, maybe I'm jumping ahead to Andrew's next question. Oh, there you go. So I'll just move that one. So that's my current water dashboard, right? And that's why right. it's so important because there's four water tanks. We don't have town water. We have no other ways of getting water. We have to well, basically get a truck in and buy water to fill it Which up. Is if we very expensive way to have water. Oh dear, it'll cost us, it would be over a thousand dollars every month. Now, um, do you use color coding here? If any of these numbers was wonky, would the no. bar be a different color? No, I don't. I don't. I do on some other things. So if I go to say uh, air quality, right, there's some coloring on that, right. for example. So I, I do it at times. But for the water now, we just need to know if there's a lot or not. We do it's always a question of what's a net good number, right? Like I see yeah. two of the tanks are virtually full, two of the tanks are half full. Is that good? Yep. Well, yeah. So, so I know that obviously. Yeah. Um, like the bore tank here, that's the one I can click on the button that says bore pump, and it'll fill up. But so right. that's not as critical. Um, but more, but, and more importantly, like it's easy to click the button on, but will it click itself off? Yes, yes, it like, will. And that's the because thing, right? <laughs> that's where I love, right? And that's yeah. that's you. I can't do that with any other system than Home Assistant. There are other ways of doing it, but I can't. I don't yeah. have the skill level to do it any other way, I don't think. Um, so yeah, so so that's definitely home assistant is oh, there we go, is definitely the way to go if you have a little bit of patience and a little bit of technical know-how and don't want to go down the rabbit hole of being stuck with one of the you know yeah. standardized platforms. I mean, I do think it's the ultimate destination. The question is, are you prepared for that destination yet? Because I'd hate yeah. to have it put you off, right? But it's, it's one of those things where you kind of have to get into trouble to know what trouble feels like. And um, you will get into trouble. <laughs> and you inevitably will, but it's like, oh, I'm just going to, I have this one app and then I have two apps and that's annoying, but then I use the Amazon device and it manages the two and that's good. Like yeah. it's, it's just, you hit a certain threshold where it's too many apps, Definitely. not all of them work. This automation is too complicated. The wrong features are surfaced and HA overcomes all of that. Mostly. Well, <laughs> and, unless you're really, you know, 
yeah. you know, now that they own ESP home and so forth, it's like now you could roll your own, right? And run with yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Android does also goes on here, just a bit of an you know, add on to this. Uh, is Google Home or two is smart enough for basic scenarios? Well, they are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. The but biggest problem is that they, system. yeah. And then, yeah, do the, can the two pieces talk to each other? And then you start putting smarts in different places for different things. So now you're trying to figure out why is that dampener opening? Which app was that? Uh -huh. right? And you start chasing it around where if you were in HA, there's exactly one place to look. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you choose to be tidy with HA, believe me, HA is it's like the rule should be, it's your foot. You can shoot it off if you want to. You can oh, make you your can home assistant experience off. terrible. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, if, yeah. Naming is difficult as we all know in development. Um, well, and, and organizing okay, and like, then what do you put where here's might be a bit of a rabbit hole so hold on people um <laughs> i've had this questions quite a few times to be honest yes. in, in comments and whatnot it, like is it prudent to have a separate so let's call iot my ssid is iot actually mm -hmm. um for all sorts of iot things uh apart from your wide, normal uh, home network i was i would always go yes yeah although in, in, and this is a weekend's worth of work Yes. To organize your network well. But the exactly. question is why? Because I don't believe it's about bandwidth. Like we have enough yep. bandwidth. If you if you've done a nice structured Wi-Fi, if you're using a, a full load of net gear, a net gear gear mesh or a ubiquity mesh, and I want to pick winners, I'm not sponsored like some people. But uh, <laughs> but given you you have decent Wi-Fi, that's not the problem. To me, the biggest issue is every so often. These, these device makers lose their minds and ship bad firmware and it auto yeah. installs and house breaks. Like you yep. folks are asking about how, uh, you know, how, how, parent, uh, a partner acceptance factor, random stuff breaking where you're not home, low acceptance factor. Very so, much so. Taking all of yes. those auto update devices and putting them on a network that does not have access to the internet until I say it has access to the internet uh -huh. so that I'm present to deal with those issues so that the house functions when I'm not home, that's important. And on to, yeah, that's good. But also security just for me. Like I don't trust IoT devices. Eh, I don't and know nor, nor should you. From. Yeah. So, you know. And you don't Whether know how good the firmware is. By the way, the 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 sun is clearly past the yard arm where I am, and uh, so it is rye bourbon time. My friend um, uh, Ed Charbonneau gave me tea. this bottle. Okay, so this nothing is nothing else but tea. In this, this is tea also. It's just tea made with barley. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> Good question, though, Andrew. Thank you so much. That's, that's yeah. really awesome because those are some of the questions that. So, I mean, the, the security up. one comes up all the time, but the controlling the behavior of your systems one, and you will eventually yep. get too many devices. I think I'm up to like 150 plus devices in the network that are related to HA stuff, like headless, I don't you know, know I mean, I got... sensors and all of those kinds of things, as opposed to the PCs and, and headed devices that I deal with. Yeah, I, I have no idea. And it's funny, Glenn, just I just saw the comment from Glenn. He also mentioned the partner acceptance factor. It is very, very important. Oh, sure. Um, unless you want to be killed slowly with a spoon. Um, Certainly not no, be able to Andrew sleep. Says, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a dev, I think I'm prepared. That's awesome. Um, otherwise, just reach out, Andrew, to either of us. I, yeah. uh, we're both very active on social media. And, the, and, the, and I'll tell you, the home, the home assistant community has evolved substantially in the past year or two to be much more approachable than it used to be. Definitely. You know, as is traditional in most open source projects, the folks that run it that ultimately are going to provide the support are really only looking for peers. Uh, and so there was a lot of RTFM back in the day. But as Nabucasa came into play and it became more of a business where yeah. new, new consumers of HA were valued, the tone changed a lot in in a very positive way. Oh yeah, and it's I can't Super. fault the community around it. I, I think mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. Um, now David's just saying that with Tuya, the HA is pretty lacking with the integration. I think it's actually not too bad. I wonder what you know what what problems are you having with it? Um, because it's you say making HA completely useless. I just don't have that experience. I find that if I have a tour device, it's, I might not get all of the features that is on the actual app for tour, like the 
the light little light strip I have behind me there, um, for, as an example, that's on Twitter. But it actually, if you use the Twitter app, you can set each segment of the light a different color, or you can do all sorts of flowy things. AT doesn't do that. It's like which color do you want? Um, and that's it. So I don't know why it's at all. I think it depends on what Twitter device you're talking about. Yeah. Well, and definitely. There's and Tuya is definitely one of the companies that had a momentary lapse of reason where they sort of became somewhat hostile to the HA um, community and then realized they were making a terrible mistake and swung back. So I think the firmware matters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I certainly have bought um, third party, for lack of a better term, IoT devices that I just uh, rebranded Tuya. And that yeah. is great because I don't have to use their silly app. I can just use the Tuya app and that'll adopt it as well. Yeah. Um, so I tend to go for those if I can. I, and if I'm going to plug stuff, that, again, I'm not compensated for, Shelly devices, I have one of each in stock. The number of things <laughs> I've in Shelly, I can't even tell you. And there, you talk about a company that gets it. You like you can use their app or not. You can control everything at HA if that makes you happy. Like You can control it directly with Wi-Fi. Like yep. it, it's, a, it's what you want to install. But fundamentally, and it's a switch. It's certified for use in Australia. Which is mm -hmm. a huge thing here. Yeah, the your thing. the the Aussie relationship with electricity is really interesting because there's up in North America, we're just not that anxious about this stuff. It's not unusual no. for a, a homeowner to change a light switch. Uh, I'm in the midst of actually adding instrumentation to my electrical power panel to individually mm -hmm. meter every circuit so that I can understand what's flowing power at any given time. And that my my when I talk to Aussies about stuff like that, they have the freaking out. No, no, I'm jealous because I want to do that. Now I don't want to yeah. die from my electrocution. That's not what I'm saying. But I have just had the electrician out for two days. And part of the what I had to pay him for was installing five Shelleys on various circuits or six oh, nice. I can't remember. But you um, found you found a sparky willing to do it. Oh, yeah, he was more than happy. He was like, oh, I've never seen this before. And then first he was, it was actually an interesting conversation because he was, uh, let's say, an older gentleman. And mm -hmm. um, he was like, why, why do you actually. bother? Yeah, like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, why Why do you bother? What's this about? And I explained to him the things that I could do with him that wasn't right. just like, oh, it's fun and it's on the internet. Woo! And he kind of got it. And from then on, he was very keen on getting them all working. Um, yeah. So it was sort of, I didn't convince him, but I've just explained the benefits, especially yeah. something like Shelly. When you're talking the, in the context of a lights uh, of a light in a house, in a house mm -hmm. where I've done, I've put Shelly's hidden them in the side of lamps. I've hidden them in my hood fan because right. fundamentally what it is, is I want to be able to remotely control the on off or variability of that device and to have mm -hmm. a physical switch also that does not impair the remote. But I don't want to change the switch, and I don't want to change the device, and that's a rare combination. It is, you and know? I want my mom to come and turn the lights on, and the lights go on, right? And, and know nothing about any of the software, or any of the exactly. rules, or anything. It's just a yeah. switch, and they hit the switch, and it works. And you've seen our places; it's it looks like the 1940s, some of it, right? Sure. But it's new; it's it's modern, it's modernized, but it's re renovated to that style. But then everything smart is behind it. So, Lars, I got to um, tell you the story that just happened a couple of weeks ago. A friend of mine, yeah, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, bought a vintage house, this is in the Netherlands. And most houses in the Netherlands are townhouses, side by sides against yep. the canal and so forth. But this was like the solicitor's house. It's a freestanding house mm -hmm. in the town. It was built in 1900. And he's done, and it's, so it's considered a historical house. He had to do a bunch of restoration work. He actually got rid of all the switches in the house. So it's more like the 1900 standard. But uh, he's hidden motion sensors everywhere. So you walk into rooms, lights turn on, and then they turn themselves back off. There's voice control in every room, so you can command the lights if you want. And in every room, <laughs> hidden in a drawer somewhere, is a little tablet that controls all the things in the room. Yeah. But oh, man. let me tell That's you how cool. neat walls look like when there are yeah. no panels on them. None. But you still need PowerPoints. Well, they're hidden down on the floor, at the floor level. Okay. But up on the walls yeah. at your eye line, no switches, no. none. Yeah, yeah. I still have a few things like I have a Sensibo controller for the air conditioning. That's still it's sort of mm. just behind the curtain, almost not quite. So it's sort of out of the way. But yeah, it's I, I appreciate that. I do like hiding things. Well, and and my experience is like I was keen on putting thermostats in every bedroom. Then I had children, and they screwed all that up. Like what I really want in each bedroom is a sensor 
to know what's the temperature, what's the humidity. And then I want to have centralized control to say, okay, well, here's how I want the rooms to behave. Like I like the granularity, but actually yeah. putting controls everywhere, I think it's almost always a mistake. Yeah. It, that's why we have automation, right? That's that's the whole idea of it. Yeah. Um, we actually had the same. I put heaters in the, the part of the house we renovated, these turbo mm -hmm. heaters, and I got them on the Wi-Fi, and uh, they're in a home assistant. Um, I can control everything through it. But, of course, there's in order to do that, there's no other way but put the Wi-Fi module on the heater, which is the thing you buy, and then you can control the temperature. Right. So the teenager invariably would put it on 140 degrees and never turn it down. Right. But then I thought, okay, how do I fix this? So now I have this thing that every hour it or every whatever 10 minutes puts the temperature back to what it should be. Yeah. <laughs> right. and, and, it's been around with, with no effort on your part whatsoever, right? It's like very yeah. automatic. It goes, ah, oh, that's incorrect. Set it back. Yep, exactly. All right. All right. So so there are ways to do it. Um yeah. let's just go back to to David was just on the tour conversation, um, so you're saying, I'll just put this one up here. You have temp sensors which works in home assist, but only once. Aha. Are these Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Z-Wave? What are they? Because I find that the Akara temperature sensors on Zigbee, in my experience, once you've paired them to a node on the Zigbee network, they will never, ever want to be on another node. It's a real pain to move them to another part of the house and try and connect them. Uh, so I don't know if it's something similar. Uh, this sounds like a different problem, but. Yeah, the uh, protocol yeah. that matters. I did put one of the Akara combination temperature motion humidity sensors in the mat in the main bathroom. And the main mm. and the thing for me was when the humidity spikes because you've run the shower, turn the fans on automatically. And the moment uh, the nice. humidity drops down to ambient, shut them off again. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh, I got, yeah, I'm going to steal that and pretend I came up with it. Um, but then we get to talk about first derivatives, which, by the way, HA can do because you can't do absolute humidity because the humidity changes. If it's raining, the uh -huh. humidity is higher and so forth. So it's for me, it's a rate of change. If the humidity is going up one half of 1% every two minutes, then you have a humidity event happening in the space. Fire it up. Yep. Yep. That's yep. That's good. Then there's, and if there wasn't a feature for that, there would be someone that made one tomorrow. That's what I would like about HA. Hey, yeah. I, the, yeah, the derivative stuff's built in. It's just an expression. You could look it up. It's trivial. Yeah. Ooh, um, okay. David said so Zigbee. David is, let's talk about Zigbee because um, I know. I have a Zigbee the, gizmo. I know. And we have, we have many Zigbee things. Um, hmm. So I'll just read. For those that don't know what Zigbee is, it's another wireless standard. I can't do you remember what the number is, 802.13 or something. I don't want them. Some I can other, light up. It's some official wireless standard. Um, so it's not Wi-Fi. You don't get an IP address, et cetera, which means you don't um, bugger up your IP um, range. You know, you don't, you don't fill your network with all these IP addresses. Um, but it's less range. It's sort of 20 to 30 meters, maybe 50 meters, depending on what you have. Um, and you've got to build up this Zigbee network. So you have a controller, which is like your Wi-Fi router somewhere. And then this controller is the one that it, all the Zigbee things talk to. But they've re to get this meshing network happening, you need to have repeating points, Zigbee repeaters. The easiest way i found to do that is that you have light bulbs because they're always on. Right. They're always powered. Switch off. Even, they're yeah. always powered, sorry. Um, and then they will repeat the signal. So that's why I now have a, a, quite a vast Zigbee network uh, here in the immediate vicinity of the farm. Um, and you can put all sorts of Zigbee things on it. And generally, they were quite low powered. So they last yeah. for a while. On if you have a lot of Zigbee, Zigbee works well. If you have a little Zigbee, yeah. it doesn't. So here's my problem with yeah. the whole light bulb thing, Lars. Uh -huh. I'm all recessed MR16 LED lighting. No Zigbee. So no Zigbee at all. And I had some uh, blind controllers that I really liked, the Axis controllers, Zigbee only. And, it's, and, and those are one of my... my Zigbee network. Yeah. So this is a Zigbee network that's going to work because there's many routes. Hmm. Right? So you Although, see there are some here that are lights. So you can see there's lots of things attached to it, with all the strings there. And then there are sensors like the um, temperature sensor in Fiona's office is not an, a, a, a repeating point, whatever they're called, node. So that only has one string. So that's kind of how it works. So all these in the middle are all lights that are just repeating the Zigbee's mesh network. Right. 
And so, yeah, may, and it's one of those challenges where you have to check, like some devices are only endpoint devices and some devices are routers. Typically the router devices are continuously powered, which is why many lights are, although not all Zigbee lights are routers. <laughs> some of them yeah. are end devices, surprise. Uh, yeah. If you're into yeah. changing light switches, something we do up here all the time, but is unusual down there, uh, many light switches are routing devices. However, I had well, enough I problems that I went out searching for a solution and I found a company called Tubes ZB and they make a bunch of Zigbee um, devices, Zigbee to Ethernet, Zigbee to USB and just straight Zigbee repeat. This is one of them. Ooh. So that's about 30 US dollars. And this is just a 3D printed chassis uh, or cover for it. But inside you can see this, that's an ESP32 and a Zigbee radio, and that's about it. And it is just a pure router. So have you got the link? You can put the link in the chat if you want. Yeah, um, it, I mean, it's. Um, can I put the link in the and chat? The, I don't even and know. the reason I find that that particularly interesting is that yes, it's great to have Zigbee if you can power it with like expand the mesh with the the light bulbs and whatnot. But I have down at my gate at the at the road, there is no power down there, so everything's running on solar. That's at the gate, the camera, and whatever. So I can't get my Zigbee network down there, which means I have to rely on Wi-Fi things, which are right. just not as good when they're running on battery. Um, so well, I do appreciate that, that the, the builder used a standard uh, antenna connector. So I have a big duck antenna for this. It'll just be low yep. impedance. There's no reason we couldn't find connectors for this that were directional, right? Like you could get into some pretty fancy antennas for me it was about penetrating walls my uh i'm using a ha yellow oh, yeah. which has built-in zigbee and because it's in a server closet not a lot of signal so just outside of that hidden away in another closet is this repeater that strengthens the signal across the whole house oh nice yeah i need to, i definitely want to look into the repeating part of it um mm -hmm. just just a question from andrew is zigbee 433 megahertz no i actually don't no. know what it is it's um, 898, 903, and 2.4. Gotcha. Yeah, because there's also 2.4. Uh, where was that? There was a oh, Glenn says Google says 2.4. So that is one of the frequencies. Yeah. Um, it is, yeah, yeah IEEE 802.15.4. And yes, yeah, so 2.4, <laughs> 9868. Gotcha. 868. I've seen that before. Yeah. Um, it's a good question about the 433 megahertz because that's the. Uh, radio or RF mm -hmm. part of home automation, <laughs> which is what my heaters are on that I spoke about before. The Nobo right. heaters, that hub is for so that the way it works is that each heater has a Wi Fi dongle that you buy separately and put on, and then they connect to a centralized hub. And initially, I was like, oh, that's silly. Why would you need that damn hub? And then that connect, blah, blah. Well, 433 megahertz has a much longer range than yep. 2.4, right? So if I had to connect everything, I would need everything being within Wi-Fi range. Instead, now I can have one hub for the whole house. Right. Um, Get so that, that into range. Yeah, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And that makes a lot of sense. And then with RF, of course, something like this wonderful device that I'm, we'll talk about a little bit later, uh, actually does RF as well. So we can mm -hmm. start automating things that uses RF, such as 433 uh, megahertz. My only 433 device in this house is a, an electric fireplace. And it makes sense that it wouldn't be IR. It's an electric yeah. fireplace. Yeah. <laughs> that would screw up the signal, something shocking. Yeah. Um, uh, my automation solution for that was a Broadcom RM4, the Pro. Uh, yep, that I have one right out here. I'll yeah, that's an on. IR repeater and a and a four, and it'll also repeat four thirty three. It's uh, one of my projects, future projects. So that's kind of what it looks like. Yep, that's the one. Yeah, um, and can't recommend them enough. Yeah, so I'm going to use this for my ceiling fans. Oh, good um, one. So, and it, is it Aaron using the Powell, IR or the 433? 433. Yeah, okay. they're, they're radio frequency. So our good friend Aaron Powell um, actually wrote a whole big blog post on it, on how to put his RF fans into Home Assistant using oh, this. It, they're a nuisance to program. Yep. I, let me tell you. Blog post on it. Yeah. When you, when you <laughs> sit down to do it, 
program every setting that's available, not just the ones you need, because uh -huh. you will not remember how to do it after you do it. So <laughs> on the possibility yeah, right. that you might need another, just do them all because it's a all. nuisance. But when you get it working, you'll be very excited. Do them all. Yeah, Talk right. about spouse acceptance factor. Uh -huh. it, the RM4 to control uh, a cable box, a television, and an input switcher all at once. So that she who must be obeyed could walk into the kitchen and say, turn on the news. And it mm -hmm. just happens. Yep. Yep. Like easily when I go through my logs of HA of what thing, you know, features used the most that aren't done by me. That's the one. Yep. Yeah. That, and that makes a lot of sense. I, just, yeah. I have this, the fans, because they're either always on or off when they shouldn't be. Right. That's just kids because in the kids bedrooms. Um, yeah. And the, it's very nice. It's a very nice setup. And I now have a Shelly behind the wall switch. There's a remote that turns the light on or the fan on. But if you turn the wall switch off, the remote doesn't work, obviously. And so I also wanted to get into HA. So the idea was to take this thing, have a Shelly behind the wall switch. So the Shelly only uh, triggers an event. It doesn't actually turn the power on or off. Right. And then in Home Assistant, it'll turn the lights on and off. And then you can still use the remote. And then this will will control the fans. So in Home Assistant, you can set the fan speed. And this will then put that into it. And then everything works like it should. And you never know that there's smarts involved. So Yeah. Hmm. And that's the always a trick. It's like, can you hide it from people who don't want to know the details? Yeah. Don't need to be aware so, at all. What's the other thing you wanted to show us? Richard, you have something that I can't get a hold of. Oh, is... oh, yes. Well, arguably the greatest sensor made to date mm. right now. That's the Akara FP2. So, so why is it great? Because it's millimeter radar. <laughs> it's mad. It's it is crazy. And for a reasonable price, of, what are these? $40 or maybe $80? Like they're just yeah, not that expensive. Yeah. They're so so they're a motion sensor, but they're using millimeter radar instead of IR. So they're so sensitive, they can tell, they can see a heartbeat. So what, what you know, at the minimum level, this is an occupancy sensor that works. Yeah. If, if there's something in the room with a heartbeat, it can tell. Like that's how sensitive it is. You could be sitting at your desk and it's not going to turn off the lights because the FP2 can tell you're still in the room. Uh, it actually has a specific mode you can use if you put it on a ceiling to detect a fall. Oh, wow. So imagine, you know, you want to help protect uh, an, an elderly loved one. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. being able to put it in a room on the ceiling and know that they're prone on the floor, not standing up, I, the sensor does that. That's I set it up because yeah, I, just... I, I have a great room. I put it at one end of the great room and had it, as you move through the room, the lights follow you through the room because oh, I can tell you distance so precisely. So I cut the room into four zones, and depending on what zone you're stand, standing in, different light turns on. I like that. Yeah, and I'm it's just, fast. I started running back and forth until I fell, uh, and watching the lights chase me like well. Wow. Yeah, I'm uh, just, it, I'm just, I'm astounded. All the videos I've seen, and all the reviews, and I just cannot get one. I've tried multiple places, and I just yeah. cannot get one. I, I, I ultimately uh, ended up ordering these from China. It's powered on USB C, um, but uh, the yeah, this is probably this is you know I'm going to get a chance to build another house before I die. Um, there'll be one of these in every room. Yeah, yeah, right. Because uh, you, yeah. you answer the hardest question of them all: what rooms are occupied? I just yeah, I just want yeah, tons of them as well, and so I yeah. can. Exactly, especially lights and heating. A heating is a big part because this place is so big and there's so many rooms everywhere. Yeah, different multiple buildings. I just want to be able to turn heaters on and off. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. that yes, that is cool. Now, I I just want to talk about this weird thing. Um, what is that thing? <laughs> it looks, so I just it looks like a Logitech it. Harmony, like which it does. Is the, it does, which has been discontinued. And you're not completely wrong. You're not completely wrong. So this um, is <laughs> has the best name ever. It's called the Best Joy Super Remote. That is its actual name. Um, that is the best name ever. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, it's made by a company either called Best Joy or iClick. I'm not sure, but it's, everything says iClick and everything says Best Joy. Um, but it is a bit like a universal remote. Mm -hmm. So the idea with this is that, yes, I can control now my TV that's out here and my air conditioner. They both work with this now. Um, but it also integrates with Home Assistant. Rather, it integrates with MQTT, which obviously is part of Home Assistant. Now, I am not very well versed in MQTT. I kind of get the basics. I've set up yeah. something and I can control things. Um, but this then connects to another box that sits just out here that it's connected to. So now I can use it as a remote for my TV, turn my TV on and off like IR remote. But I can also click a button here on it that says, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, it's tricky because it's going to focus on my face. There we go. It says light. Nice. So I can click on the light and it turns my light on and off. And yeah, that's a pretty basic automation. But that's all through MQTT, which is a, a service bus essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I still look at M, if you MQTT is an is one of those things where if you don't this is what makes HA great if there's an integration that's awesome if there isn't an integration there's a number of workarounds there's yep. ESP home and MQTT like there are ways to take a product that is not got an interface to HA and still be able to work with it yeah that's right um and there's there's an official add-on for the mosquito MQTT broker Mm -hmm. uh, in HA, which works just fine. Um, yeah. But I haven't done much with with MQTT, which hence yeah. this was an interesting device because I had to figure it out. Um, and yeah, it's 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 not bad. It's not Logitech kind of quality, but it does so much more. Right. Um, and it supports tens of thousands of devices. I'd say there's so many options. Um, and it's so it is an device. IR blaster at the in in its essence yep. then. Yeah. yeah, there's IR, it does Bluetooth, uh, it does 2.4 gigahertz, so like your mouse dongle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, it does um, RF, um, 433 and what's the other one? 300 and something. Something like that, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, so it does everything. And it's sort of, you have to get your head around it because this little scrolly button in the middle does many things and whatnot. But I just thought it's such an interesting, different device. Um so I, when you run a YouTube channel with technology, lots of companies wants to send you their thing. Would you like our air purifier? No, I do not. Um, but once in a while, there is these interesting devices. And I'm like, I, I mainly said yes because I just couldn't understand why or how. Right. Um, but I kind of get it now. Another YouTuber made a just an automation. He presses one button that says movie, and his whole movie room or media room just changes like the curtains are drawn the light goes down the tv turns on etc so yeah they and it's very partner friendly it's damn remote you just click the buttons right so yeah yeah so they're willing to pick it up and push things on it and it has good instructions mm. on it. yeah exactly yeah. um so david just has david thank you david uh in terms of our wave sensors so lewis from everything smart home um, mm -hmm. If you don't know his channel, go on and have a look at that. He does some really, really good videos um, on many things, smart home. But he's made his own millimeter yeah. wave sensor that he sells. As an occupancy I sensor. I, yeah. I, have a, I think I've back-ordered a couple of those, just haven't gotten them. But uh, Yeah, yeah. That's with anything. When you create something excellent that's not very expensive, yeah. you're not going to be making enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, here goes your whole life. That's all you're going to be doing from now on is uh -huh. making a bunch of yeah. those. I'm dealing with support. Um, oh, Glenn's saying, can we get a link for that remote? Absolutely. Let me, let me just find that. I went, I went um, to Amazon and typed in Happy Joy Univer uh, Universal Remote and saw it right away. Best Joy. Or um, Best Joy, yes. And it is, I mean, I made, my video is very long. It's like 32 minutes and it's coming out in the next few days. Uh, but the reason for that is that I spend an awful lot of time figuring out how it does it. And I thought I'd leave that in because if I have trouble figuring out how the hell it works, I'm sure more other people will have as too uh, have as well. Um, so, but there, you can just skip to the HA part if you want. <laughs> um, so it's yeah, it's an interesting device. I like when when companies come up with something strange like that. It's good. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's um, interesting with especially with the Zigbee, the whole peer to peer nature of that. It's like a little bit of Zigbee is terrible. A lot of Zigbee is usually pretty good. And we didn't even talk about yeah. matter. Yeah, exactly. And, and 
How, do you want to explain that? I made a whole video on it. I'm still not sure I can explain it right. <laughs> Have you ever seen the XKCD video or, or graphic or cartoon where the guy goes, oh my God, there's 12 different specifications for this. Yep. We should consolidate these. Now there's 13 specifications. Correct. Matter is that. Zigbee was supposed that. to be a standard. And then it turned out that different vendors implemented it in different ways. And so most of the time Zigbee stuff works together. Some of the time it doesn't. And so they came up with another standard called Matter, which they really swear for sure, absolutely, everybody's going to be compatible. But you should replace all of your equipment again. Again. So yeah. yes and but no. Mostly but it's think, Zigbee. Yeah, it mostly is. So Matter is not a new uh, hardware technology. Like we're not getting another frequency or anything like that. It's a, it's a language, right? It's a protocol on top of everything. So the idea, if, in, correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you have Zigbee devices and you have your Samsung smart things and you have your Apple, whatever, and you have your, your AWS, or so your Amazon Alexas and all those things, they will now be able to talk to each other in a common language because some number of vendors, 500, 600, whatever it is, have signed up and says, yes, we will support Matter. Um, so ideally you can use your Samsung hub with your Akara smart whatever, um, or you are something. But it requires that everybody uh, supports matter. And like Richard said, I am still holding my breath to see if that will actually happen because there's many yeah. promises and then there's a few devices for each. And it is well, just and, a firmware update. And, and in my experience, the vendors are highly incented to optimize their devices to work with their own devices and not incented at all, arguably disincented to work with other devices. And that keeps showing mm -hmm. up. And the uh, honestly, the only folks on our side are the home assistant folks. Because HA doesn't have a horse in this race, right? HA is a group of open source maintainers and occasionally will do implementations of HA automations for devices against that vendor's will. You know, oh, yeah. they, they'll make stuff work even though the vendor doesn't want to work with the rest of us. So, exactly. you know, like Two is a good example. So two is yeah. pretty good. Two is pretty open um, because they want everyone to use two. But someone has said, no, I don't want everything to go by the two cloud. So they made a two year local integration right. for Home Assistant. So you can, if you know the IP and you have the whatever MAC address, et cetera, you can adopt these things directly in Home Assistant on the local network. Um, so yeah, there's always someone that finds a way around yeah. because we're nerds. <laughs> Because and, and we're bad, and there's more of us than them. Now that to be clear, yep. how does HA make a living? HA makes a living off of Nabucasa. Mm -hmm. So at, when HA matured to the point that they have a they had a really good UI, the Lovelace UI, which is what we make the dashboards and things out of. Very quickly they ran into the issue that works great inside the home, but as soon as you want to be remote, now you need a remote connection and setting up reverse DNS and opening ports yep. to your firewall beyond most people. I mean, mm -hmm. we're network geeks. That's not a big deal. We could make it work. What they really wanted was a web proxy. Yep. And a and a web proxy isn't free. So they set up Nebucast and they said, Hey, five bucks a month, web proxy. And for five bucks a month, it's hard to be unhappy. But let's be clear. Once you've signed up 10, 20,000 users for your web proxy, it ain't costing you five bucks a month per person anymore. Oh, no. But at $60 a year, what do you care? You're supporting it and it works like a hot damn. And suddenly oh, yeah. they had some money. Mm. And honest to goodness, like this speaks well of Frank and all of those guys. Like it didn't go to their heads. What they did was make everything better. Like yeah. fairly, you, yeah, you know. What they do with the ESP home guys is they basically said, hey, you know this part-time thing you've got that everybody depends on that makes you crazy? Why don't you make that your full-time job, right? Let's acquire you, yeah. acquire uh -huh. ESP home, make it part of HA, and now you just work on ESP home. We can pay you a salary. All off the so back much. of yes. Nabucasa. So much better. Like, because I have it's a fair so few much of better. these. And I can just, I can now update my devices directly through the home assistant updater thingy. I don't yeah. have to do a custom thing and upload and do the blah, blah, blah. It's well, the other thing that's happened, and I think it's been one of the challenges, is somebody was into HA several years ago when it was pretty freewheeling. We got to do what we wanted to do. As yeah. Nabucasa came into play and less experienced people were using HA, the HA leadership realized, hey, we need to do this safer. 
we're now having a lot of folks involved in this that don't understand what they're doing when they go into hacks, don't understand what they're doing when they're bringing in custom bits from GitHub. They're just following the scripts and they can get themselves into trouble. And so they've slowly been locking HA down to do more and more secure processes, which for a good old fashioned hacker like me is a nuisance. Like I didn't have a problem. I knew what I was in for. I used one of the Lutron hacks way in the beginning. And they're finally yep. like, listen, there's an officially supported Lutron pro uh, connector process that uses WebID properly, and you should do this. We're going to turn this hack off. And I'm like, ah, you're not wrong. Yeah. But what did it mean? It meant two hours on a Saturday, taking yep. all the old bits out, bringing the proper integration in, configuring it correctly, and now it auto-updates, and I don't have to think about it. Like, they're making us eat our vegetables and, by golly, even liking it. Yeah, yeah, because the end result is so much better. I it's have more reliable. Uh, I bought one of I bought one of these Sky Connects, I think they're called, which is when you have an HA yellow, which is any a version of Home Assistant runs on a dedicated Raspberry Pi board with an MM2 <laughs> memory chip. Yep. Like that. Is that right? Um so but it also has Zigbee built in. It has a Zigbee controller. I don't have that. So I went and bought what's called a Conbee 2, which is a great device as well but it's not part of home assistant so i've now i have the sky connect which is their way of retrofitting basically what you have with the yellow yeah um to get matter and zigbee into home assistant in an easy way so i still i'm still yet to do it um but it's one of those things where you go oh, i probably should do it it's going to take me a couple of hours because i got to redo everything on zigbee but uh, it's probably worth it so <laughs> we're talking very casually about some of this hardware stuff because most people who play with HA play with it on a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. And I have nothing bad to say about Pies. I have Pies. Pies are good. However, SDs are evil. Yep. Uh, like, yep. You, you want to upset the significant other? Depend on an SD in your house. That is a good way to upset a significant <laughs> oh, other because SDs fail. And yeah. so the... Well, the original was the blue, but I don't think you can get a blue anymore. I ordered a there blue immediately. Go. By the way, the blue is gorgeous. I mean, it's a teeny little, it's just an O-Droid piece of hardware that runs HA brilliantly. It's totally well, solid state, no moving parts. It's got a big heat sink on the bottom of it. Like I, I've got it up at the cabin. And then the yellow is the modern version of it. And the yellow is in every respect superior, except for one thing. It needs... Yes. Uh, well, no, it needs a CM4, right? Oh, oh. That's the problem with the yellow is you have to get a Raspberry Pi CM4. And a Raspberry Pi CM4 is a phenomenal piece of hardware that is out of stock everywhere for the past two years. Like there are now dedicated websites to just tracking when these things come into play. If you're willing to pay double, you can probably find one on Amazon. Yeah, right. But you can get them. Uh, running uh, SSD and M2. You can get them with built-in memory. Like there's lots of choices. But the main thing is you get SD out of your life. So, and Glenn's question, the CM4 is a form factor of the Raspberry Pi built for reliability. And they're just, they've just not been able to stock them up. So I use a site called rpilocator.com. That will <laughs> literally <laughs> help you... <laughs> keep track of when cm4s are available so you can grab one but a cm4 loaded in a yellow that's like the ultimate ha operator and it's solid but yeah it's just a form factor but you're getting rid of all the unreliable components you know then yeah, I, it's then i drop module i just learned yeah that's the compute module and then you drop a terabyte um m2 into that chassis and it's like you got enough space you're good no moving parts no fans no, you know, no cry. Yeah. You're just happy. Yeah. I just clicked then, on the link to go and buy one, and it literally said 404 on the on the product page. Nice. On this vendor. <laughs> so go to rpilocator.com and let's see what the state of affairs is right now. Because it'll literally show you what the current list okay, of okay. different Raspberry. There's literally no CM4s in stock anywhere at the moment, according to RPI Locator. Let's go. Okay. I'm gonna share that here hang on Let's see what we get yeah. uh, and wow okay, there we go so look that just zeros 
zeros and some RPI threes. Like there are no CM fours in stock anywhere. Wow. So yeah, that's mad. So if you want, if you want a zero, you can get one. Zero, by the way, is a very tiny one. There's not as small yeah. as a nano, I think. Or which nano is smaller or zero is smaller? I can't remember now. Yeah, I'm not even sure. Now, if I go onto Amazon in Canada and I look for a Raspberry CM4, I bet you I can find one for like 300 bucks, something that really should cost $70. Here you go. A CM4 with uh, Wi-Fi built in and 4 gigs of RAM for $250. That's a $60 part that is just gouging. Because they know that if you want it bad enough, you'll yep. pay it, right? Yep, exactly. And and, oh, you, and and when these things were in stock, you can get them up to thirty-two gigs of RAM. Like you get them huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do need to update mine because I have a Raspberry Pi four B, whatever they call. Yeah. Um, and and that's it, right? So I'm I just do lots of backups. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they, they, they can gouge they do gouge like i think there are uh, the msrp for the 32 gig without wi-fi which is probably your ideal yellow uh -huh. config because you're going to plug it into the network anyway in the chassis yep retail yeah you know, msrp and that's like a hundred dollars but good luck finding one Jeepers. yeah exactly wow yeah still uh, shortages and glenn's talking about nux like i was very tempted to run this on the knock my first uh actual um uh, HA instant was uh, in Hyper-V because I have servers because I'm an idiot. And uh, so I just set up a Hyper-V instance for it. But you know what? The Hyper-V instance was not as fast as that yellow. Like, yeah, right. it doesn't, you know, there's something to be said about dedicated hardware. It's just like fast. But you can run HA on virtually anything. It just doesn't mean you should. Right? No, like, no, that's But it will true. run on anything pretty much. Yeah. But for me, it was, hey, for a couple of hundred dollars, I can build dedicated hardware designed for the problem with a bunch of chipsets built in that you know already work and is hardwired sitting on a U sitting on a, a UPS because this thing needs to be absolutely reliable when I am not home. Yep, exactly. And that's that's kind of like where I'm, it'll be a future video. I'll upgrade the, the hardware for it because it'll. I need to do it. It's mm. one of those things like changing your outdoor cables to outdoor rated cables. To outdoor rated <laughs> cables, right? It's like, yeah. or be miserable, right? Like perpetually mm -hmm. be chasing phantom problems. Yeah, which is what I did. So now yeah. my first thing is spend $12 on a cable and change the damn cable. See if it still persists. Yeah. So. I, yeah. And, and I mean, I don't, you know, I'm not a monster cables guy. I get my cables from Monoprice, which is very inexpensive, but I buy the premium cables from Monoprice. Yeah. You have a choice between the $1 cable and the $3 cable. Buy the $3 cable. <laughs> buy right. the $3 cable. So Andrew's asking, what about those fanless mini PC sticks? I mean, uh, I'm not it, very familiar with those. Yeah, they'll run it. The, the, it's just always a question of, you know, do they have the right horsepower in the right places? The big thing is you're going to want to add Zigbee and possibly Z-Wave. And so you're going to need a bunch of USB on that. Mm. So how well is that going to behave? And is it a supported yeah. chipset? Even Bluetooth. So, I've added a Bluetooth dongle on a, on a long yeah. USB extension on mine. Um, Bluetooth is actually really, really good with Home Assistant. If you can get the mm -hmm. range, you can get the, there's extremely reliable, those devices. Yeah. So, and they speak all the protocols and, and it's, you know, again, we're building this sort of tapestry of first I put in really great structured Wi-Fi, yeah. then, you know, had a, had a really reliable device running. And so that you're able to add in different signal sets and commit to various stacks. Like you don't need to support them all. Uh, I, I've, I have consciously lynched the last Z wave out of this house because yeah, I never had any. who needs yet another stack. I couldn't mm, get away from Z. I would have lynched Zigbee if I could have, but I, there was a few devices that only had Zigbee and I liked them. So, okay. Mm, but that means then like go Zigbee. all in on Zigbee, right? Like then yeah. I've deliberately I bought a bunch of sensors and things. It's like make Zigbee work for you. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, we have, we're almost out of time. What, is, what are you working on next in terms of home automation, apart from, putting all your electricity connections and circuits into Well, and that's the thing, right? Is I found these, this is from, uh, um, 
circuit setup. Like just there are third party companies that make like sense and the and the co and, and so forth that make power sensing system, but this is all this is all e, yeah, ESP32. This comes from yeah, circuit right. setup. It's circuit setup.us. Okay. And they're stackable boards. So this one has this runs the ESP32 and then it has six ports on it. The individual connectors, these are these are um, impedance connectors, so they're magnetic. So you literally uh, just put you put the load wire through this little connector here, snap it closed, and it can measure when electricity throw, flows through the wire. Nice. Typically, you'd put these in the power box, but you don't have to. No, they right? go anywhere. Anywhere that anywhere that you had current flowing, this will measure how much current is flowing through the wire. And these are the little little ones. So these are for your little ten amp and fifteen oh, yeah. amp circuits. But I have hundred amp ones. So it's like, mm -hmm. do I, if I want to know if my generator is running, not just by oh. the noise, but by the fact that I have amps running down that circuit, I have a big clamp for that. Uh -huh. So I know, not only know it's running, I know how much power is being pulled from it. Yeah, right. Right. Oh, these and, are good. But, yeah, I like those. But, but because it just runs on an ESP32 with that controller board, it just surfaces an ESP home. Right. And it says, okay, here's, and you can stack these boards together. In fact, do I have one of the stacks here? Oh yeah, here's this what is one of the stack board? boards. Circuit board at US. This is circuit setup dot US. Right. See that well. But okay. you know the classic one for me in the, in this part of the world is an electric dryer. Because an electric yeah. dryer here is a 240 volt device. It has it uses a, the two legs. And so most of the time, if you're just going to monitor a circuit, you would just get a plug adapter, right? And that plug mm. adapter would connect to Wi-Fi, and it would tell you the amount of power being consumed out of that plug. But it doesn't work for a, for a 240. So instead, being able to clamp to the actual load circuit, yeah, I can yeah, tell yeah. exactly what's flowing through it. Oh, that's brilliant. So the other thing is that it's not visible, right? Again, in that spouse mm. acceptance factor, the whole... What are all these things sticking out of my walls? Like, that's a problem. So being able to hide yeah. it all, very powerful. I don't even like that's me. My OCD does not allow cable. No, no. I have to hide. Dude, it. I'm now on a mission to get rid of light switches. Like I'm in a crazy place, right? But <laughs> the the idea that we could instrument that well and just not have anything visible and know exactly yeah. what power was flowing where, that's my current favorite project. It's like. I know what's going on, but I don't have to yeah. interrupt you. You know, that is, the, pretty, that is pretty good. Yeah. You throw yeah, in that uh, millimeter wave radar. So I know where you're standing in the room. I know what, yep. you know, you, that you were standing in front of the dryer and then I can see the dryer turn on because it's power draw. I, I have <laughs> magic creepy. powers. Yeah. <laughs> I have magic powers. Yeah. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. Um, I actually just yesterday got a bunch of Unify stuff delivered. So more Unify. More, more. Um, I'm going to upgrade. Uh, my 24 port switch is running out of power. I keep getting alerts for power budget. Um, so I need to upgrade that. And I am actually going to put an outdoor switch up the hill. So I've got this little nice flex utility switch, which uh, can run off a POE, which is very cool. Very so nice. that's another another project. Um, and a few cameras and stuff. So uh, actually, I'm going to upgrade my my link to this building is via these nano stations. So it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a wireless link. But in terms of Unified thinks it's wired. They can't tell they're not wired. No, it doesn't make And they run at about 200 megabit, 250, something like that. Right. But... Now I'm moving files because I do so much 4K recording. I'm moving files from here to the house back and forwards, and it's actually quite slow. You're saturating. Um, yeah. So I've got gigabit connection now that I'm going to yeah. replace it with. Move to the max antenna so you can move gigabit yeah. plus. So, so that's another. So no, I don't have any home automation project as such, but then no. it's all thrown in there. Like yesterday. It's all about was, more yeah. bandwidth, just more, yeah. more. Well, that more too. Bandwidth. But just I just enjoy the little things I don't make any videos out of. Like Fiona bought a fountain a little fountain that just sits on a desk and dribbles and she likes to know the sound of the water trickling etc right. um but i'm like okay but it's powered by usb so it's got to sit somewhere on the in some and it was just a bit messy so i put it in a zigbee switch and there's a motion sensor in there so when she walks in the room it turns on turns on lovely yeah. little things 
Yeah, no, I made her very happy when the moment you touch any door going into the garage, the lights turn on. And yep. 10 minutes after nothing's happened in the garage, the lights turn off. That's what I have in the carport. Exactly you know? the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are the automations they notice and care about. You know, we overthink well, these do, things. They make a difference. Yeah. Or just the, the hey, you the, the outdoor lights turn on at night. But if you get to the house, disarm the alarm and open the front door, the light should just turn on. Because clearly yeah. you're entering the house. That's so right. why wouldn't you illuminate your entrance? Why are you groping for a light switch? Exactly. Especially since I want to remove all the light switches. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right. That's awesome. I think we're going to end there, Richard. It's already been over an hour. Um, thanks so much for joining us. That was really yeah, cool. That was I, good I fun, friends. Stories. Yeah, yeah you absolutely. Bet. So thanks, everybody, for watching. And if you're watching this after it was live, well, thank you. Um, we still like your questions. Put them in the comments, and uh, we'll answer them there. So um, <sighs> all right. Back to work. See you, everybody. <laughs>